gentlemen, please welcome Tammy Bruce, Deputy Editor at the Washington Times. Hey! Great! Hi, everybody. Uh, boy, this is a fabulous CPAC, isn't it? Are you guys uh, ready to take this nation back? Yeah, yeah. This is, uh, sure, there's politics and there's partisanship and you're, you're Republicans or maybe you're independents, but this is about the future of your family. It is about the future of the country. It is our generation that will take this nation back and will take it back for the next hundred years. So our panel today, you hear all the time the left trying to divvy Americans up into one group against another, don't you? It's women against men, it's gays against straights, it's blacks against whites, it's dogs against cats, right? Well, this is a panel of all women. You will know these women. Uh, they are working in a variety of ways, think tanks, political commentators, they're in the arena. They are the ones who make the difference. How many of you here are fighting for this country because of, uh, of your mother? Yeah? How about for your sister? How, how about for yourself, right? Now this is it. When our lives get better as women, everybody's lives get better, right? When the world wants reform, it turns to women, and there is a reason for that, because of our understanding of the quality of everyone's lives. If you, how many of you have a loved one serving in the military? Yeah? Well, you know that you want a commander-in-chief who has a set of rules that allows your loved one to kill the enemy when they can, don't you? It's funny how it's been the boys who have been kind of infantilizing this nation. We know about babies, and we know how they grow up, and we know how they save freedom for the world. We understand about the economy, don't we? You want your children to live under their own roof for a long time, not in the back seat of your car, right? You know if you want to take your child to the doctor, it's going to be a pediatrician. It's not going to be a community health care center that takes three months to get an appointment when you don't know what's wrong with your child. If the left and the liberals watching this program, if I probably would be helpful if I stood still for a second, are all excited because they see some weak men running the Republican Party, you had better put your seatbelt on for the conservative women who will take this country back. And for the men in this audience, I know I, I see some of the men starting to look a little frightened. Are you guys going to be with us as partners in this adventure? You're going to stand next to that woman you love for those women that are a part of your life and the women who you don't even know yet. But we're the ones who are going to do it. Let me introduce you now to this panel as an example of the kind of women who have been fighting for you, who are fighting for you now, and who will. And as they work through think tanks, deal with media and commentary, help shape public opinion, and enter the arena themselves. First of all, Sabrina Schaefer. She is the executive director of the Independent Women's Forum, a contributor to Forbes magazine. You see her on Fox News all the time. Her background is in political behavior, public opinion research. Her values are, of course, a value of limited government, personal liberty, and economic freedom. There is Sabrina for you right there. I told you to put on your seatbelts. Crystal Wright. Some would say Crystal is a triple threat, a woman, a black woman, and a Republican living in a Democrat-dominated city of Washington, D.C., a communications consultant, editor and publisher of conservativeblackchick.com. Will you remember that, maybe? Yeah? That's an easy, that's, you can remember that. Uh, and she, of course, you can read her columns at townhall.com, Crystal Wright. Another woman you are more than familiar with who's been helping to save this nation, Kate Obenshane. She is a journalist, a political commentator, vice president of the Young America's Foundation. She was the chair of the Republican Party of Virginia 
from 2002 to 2006 and was the first woman to serve in that post. You see her on Fox News as well, and perhaps as a speaker on your college campus, she is on the board of directors of the Claire Booth Luce Foundation, Kate Obenshane, right there. And a young woman who is in the arena, Mary Linda Garcia. She serves in the New Hampshire House of Representatives. The, National, the Republican National Committee has named her a rising star just last year. And she is a candidate again. She is running for New Hampshire's second congressional district in the upcoming midterms, which by the way, as I move over here to manage this conversation, do all of you remember 2010? Oh yeah. yeah. Women, for the first time in ages, voted in a majority for conservative candidates. We mattered in that election. We took that election. We will take 2014 as well with the help of these women. That's right. Yeah. I, so. I do too. If they're smart. All right. So let's start. We're going to have a, a few comments from each of the women here. And then we're going to have our own little, oh, the five. How, what do you think about that? Nice conversation. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. We don't need Bob Beckel, do we? No, no, we don't. All right, so Sabrina, we were talking uh, earlier about the nature of your work and what matters here when it comes to, look, here's a panel full of women. There's some, supposed to be some war on women, of course, so we know that the left brings that to us. What is it about gender differences and why we need to have this conversation? What's the difference for us? Well, look, we need to start thinking and talking seriously to women, and we need to realize that that's not playing gender politics. I think so many conservatives respect that men and women are different. How many of you have kids? I have, I have two oh, yeah. girls. I have a son. They are different, yeah. <laughs> right? The girls love their pretty and pink culture. It's not imposed on them. My son will kick anything in a you know, one inch radius of him. Um, in normal life, we, we embrace these differences. But when it comes to the political sphere, it's like we forget all about it. But the way that men and women respond to messages, the way that they think about things, their um, intrinsic values, they're going to be different. And that's OK. We're equal, but we're different. All right. Uh, and it, we're going to be able to expand. I've got so many questions already in my head. I know a lot of you do as well. Um, and when we think about differences and imagery, Crystal, um, we, we go into another framework here because, I mean, there's so many questions we have, but we also know that we've got a focus of needing to take the, the nation back as a whole. Um, to do that, though, of course, it involves elections. Hmm. What about women and the vote? We, we know that in 2010, for a midterm, we, women voted as a majority for conservatives. They weren't organized to do it. Nobody told them to do it. We did it because we knew it was important. What about this upcoming midterm and women in the vote? Well, the Republican Party doesn't have a great record with women, as we saw evidence from the last presidential election. Uh, Mitt Romney lost uh, by 10 percentage points. And for me, I think it's really an optics problem that Republican Party has. Why do we continue to allow men to talk about our issues, to talk about child rearing, reproductive rights, what's happening in the home? Why do we have men in our party talking, I would say, in not great terms, that is not helpful when, you know, when you're talking about rape and spontaneous abortions, I'm not gonna revisit the names of these folks. Why can't all, you see great women on this stage right now. We can talk very well about women's issues because we're moms, we're independent business women, we're running for office. So I think it's an, I think at a basic minimum, it's an optics issue. We have great women in Congress. We need more. We only have 19 women serving in the House of Representatives. We've got great governors. We have like four senators. But why won't the Republican Party get it? Let the women put our face out there for Pete's sake. Otherwise, guys, I got news for you. The demographics of the country are changing. Women are in charge. You know, four out of 10 households with kids under the age of 18 are headed by single women. So we have to stop sending the subliminal message that if you're married and you're bearing a lot of kids, you're better than people like me who don't have children. You know why I'm a conservative? Because conservatism empowers me to be whatever kind of woman I want to be. Mm -hmm. And that's the message we need to be sending. And that's a great, that's a great point. And a great transition to the issue of messaging. Because you know, for us as women, we're dealing with a dynamic here where it's the conservative ideal is the thing that allows people to live the lives that they want to live, that we choose, that best suit us as individuals. None of us are the same. We're all going to make different kinds of choices. 
and it's only the conservative ideal that allows that. Uh, for, for you, Kate, when it comes to messaging and optics, the nature of how to confront what Crystal laid out, what, what do you say? Well, I think part of the problem is with this war on women meme, a lot of folks are saying, oh, it's run its course, the messaging doesn't work anymore. Okay, that's our head in the sands, folk. It yeah. works, it works really well. Just in Virginia this last election cycle, we got kicked by uh, nine points. Ken Cuccinelli lost by nine points in Virginia, and he lost solely on the war on women attacks. We had the ideas on our side. We can articulate, for the, in the majority, we articulate the ideas effectively. But there's a vacuum when it comes to women's issues. If women in America think that Republicans and conservatives hate them, they're not going to vote for them. It doesn't matter what they believe on economic policies or, frankly, anything else. If we are misogynists, which is how we're being portrayed by Hillary Clinton and by the left, they're not going to vote for us. And what we did in Virginia was a huge mistake, and I hope every candidate for 2014 takes note of it. Every time a women's issue was mentioned, an attack, a vicious, baseless attack, you know what our guy did, our, our candidate for governor did? He said nothing. He did not respond. The message from the consultants was, don't talk about it. For one thing, women don't care. They don't want to hear you talk about it. Don't talk about it. You have to respond when somebody hurls vicious invective at you. You have to say, Violence Against Women Act, prime example. If somebody says, Ken Cuccinelli or whoever it is, is opposed to the Violence Against Women Act, and then he comes back and starts talking about economic policy, that's just hanging out there. Wait a minute. He doesn't care about women being safe. What we need to do is come back and say, well, actually, I believe in genuine protection of against violence to women. I don't believe in payoffs to the trial lawyers, which is what Virgi um, Violence Against Women Act is all about. And this is my proposal for effectively combating violence against women. Let's talk effectively, but don't leave the myth hanging out there. I, I think we all know that there you know, if you've been around CPAC, I, it's been at least 50% women. I mean, this has been, you see this audience in the hallways. Young people, have you seen the young people also? Look, the reason there is this attempt to cast Republicans in that way is because they know women matter. Right. They know you will vote for your family and for the economy. They know that it's, you're not going out there thinking, oh, great, we can all smoke pot now. Too bad we're living in the back seat of our car, right? <laughs> now, every, these are very basic things that speak to the future of what it is we're doing. All generations, whether it's about health care or the economy or anything else. And when it, it's, it's interesting because now we, we go to you, Mary Linda. The nature of not only that men are running, but perhaps not even being advised by women. Right. But here you have, and we talk about the number of women in office, but you have an interesting story about, look, you're a young woman, you're a minority woman, and you, you ran, you've won, you're running again. How did that work for you? Sure. As a college student, I had my Republican values firmly intact. I believed in personal responsibility, individual liberty, freedom, opportunity, that our country is exceptional, all of those good things that I think resonate. All right, so President, 2016. <laughs> <laughs> we got her right here. And my basic civic responsibility in my mind was to vote and then help elect candidates, get involved in campaigns for those who's, uh, who represent my values. So when I graduated from college, I thought, let me get involved in a midterm election. Who needs help? So my takeaway and what I try to do now is point out that someone at that point suggested to me, wait a minute, instead of helping on someone's campaign, why don't you run? Oh. And the thought had never crossed my mind before. Um, and there's a lot of data you know, from the private sector to the public sector that women on average, are less likely than men to ask for a raise, you know, to ask for a promotion, and run for office. Men apparently are born thinking, you know, I should be president. <laughs> That's right. And women are busy doing whatever, all the important things they do, and, sure. and then, again, follow into because they're passionate about an issue or whatever the case sure. may be. So my story is... I ran, then through that, of course, I had the tools necessary, as so many you know, women and conservative women do, mm -hmm. um, and I was able to apply those to policy and be effective in my community. So I'm now in my fourth term. I've been very involved now for going on eight years. Excellent. And at this point, thank you. And what I found was that 
working on the reforms I've been, been able to actually achieve and continue to work on in my state, my federal representative is frankly part of what is a very adversarial federal government that we're all familiar with. So I thought, you know what, now's the time to try to stop the obstacles from my state's development from being um, mandated down from Washington. So I decided to run for Congress against my first term liberal congresswoman. So Excellent. that's what I'm doing now. That's, that's the midterm coming up. Now, thank you for all of that. We, we have, I think you've got a general sense here that these are women that you're familiar with. You can relate to them. This is not unusual. There's powerful women everywhere. The 2010 election really was, while it was, the Tea Party was important in that, women were leading Tea Party, but more than that, it was that messaging from women to the rest of the country and to the rest of the women. Sabrina, let, well, let's open it up at this point now for a conversation, but let me, and let me put this out there. We know what the problem is, right, you guys? We know that there's some weird attempt by people to, that they think that these things can be controlled by polls or somebody has a strategy or there's some genius out there, the Einstein of politics, who's gonna explain how to speak to women. But isn't it about that inherently we understand what those messages are? Sabrina, is that part of what your belief is? I think yes and no. I think that if you look at what's going on on the left, we are out-researched, outnumbered, and outspent by groups like Emily's List, the American Association of University Women, the National Women's Law Center, Women's Voices, Women Vote. I mean, the list goes on and on. And, and the amount of resources they have, it, 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 we, are, we are like a little pill bug <laughs> compared to the big gorilla. Um, Emily's List, to put it into perspective, raised $52 million in 2012, and they have invested not only resources, but, but over a decade of serious social science research into how to reach women. Now, I don't think you need to necessarily go to those lengths. I think, like you said, there's a lot that we can just guess at, right? But we're not really in the position to guess anymore. I think we are at a point where we need to figure out what actually moves women. I can tell you from research that the Independent Women's Forum has done on, on the debt research, on the Paycheck Fairness Act, and the war on women, on Obamacare, men and women don't respond the same. They might want the same thing. Let me tell you about the debt research we did. When you talk to women about preserving social security, that's what gets them to want to cut, to want to, to want to cut back on spending because they want that security. And, and isn't, that's it, isn't that that's where we go as women, though? And for any of you to chime in here, that isn't it about that we already know about the economy? We've been handling the, the pocketbook. We know about safety for our families because it's our children who go to war. We, know, we worry about whether or not they're warm, whether or not there's enough money. You look at the paychecks now or the, your, ba your bank account. Your health insurance has gone up. Will you be able to pay the rent? Isn't this what women already know? Yeah, they do, Tammy, but I think it goes back to what Kate said. We are not, I think back to the 2012 presidential election when President Obama was recruiting female celebrities, he was presenting the life of Julia and the life of government dependency as the panacea, the golden apple that all women want. And what did we do? Mitt Romney and all his surrogates, they were silent. What I would have done is you have, again, a stage full of bright women. We're all doing different things. We could say, do you really want to be um, dependent upon government? And to your point, Tammy, the economic policies of individual empowerment work whether you're a woman, whether you're yeah. a minority, whether you're a gay person or a straight person. That's right. We are just not fundamentally talking about pushing back on government dependency and these messaging, and, and I, would, I would say that there is money there. The Koch brothers, you know, I understand we, we do need to do research, and I agree with what Sabrina was saying, but, you know, the Koch brothers, I think, are putting out, what, $30 million in the midterm elections? So there's money there, but they're not utilizing the talents and assets that we have now. And, and one poll to kind of wrap this up, there was a poll recently that found 55% of Americans think the GOP does not understand women. And when you poll women alone, all women, regardless of party affiliation, it goes to like 60% of women in America think that we don't understand women. And I'm gonna say something that's gonna probably upset people, but you know, hey, I'm, I, I try to just put it out there. 
Part of it is basic optics. How did we start this conference? With one gender representing the movement of the conservative party. That's how we kicked off this conference on Thursday. So what I think we need to do, we shouldn't have all the yep. women stacked up on one day. I think it's great that we have women, but we need to mix it up a little bit because until people start seeing yep. women and minorities see yep. themselves reflected in the face of the party, it's like marketing. I We're think not gonna win this is, presidential yeah. elections. This is a kind of thing. Anyway, for you watching at home and for you here, this is not a spectator sport, is it? Yeah. This is about being heard. And you, you, can, you know us, but you also know the powerful women in your own life. You are a powerful woman. Make them hear you when it comes to how we proceed, even in your local area. You know, uh, Tammy, I yeah. want to say something about that, because we need buy-in from men and women within this movement. Yes, we yeah. need everybody to understand those statistics that you just heard are damning for conservatism. If women don't think that we represent them, we've got to do something about that. I know where a lot of folks are coming from. 10 years ago, I would have said, I'm not talking differently to women. I, you know, I'm a conservative. I believe in the fundamental ideas, and I'm not doing what the left does. Me too. Well, I have totally changed on that, folks, because women think that we don't represent them. We need to change how we talk to women, how we, we need to think about our messaging, and are we directly reaching out to women? Some of the issues that we yeah. don't hit on are the best issues for women. Gun control. You really want your daughters to be defenseless on yeah. college campuses and not be able to defend themselves? Use those issues. That's a woman's issue. It's a woman's issue, but we run away from it. And you're, I want to say one thing about what Mary Linda said about um, running for office, how women need a little extra push. She is exactly right. When I was chairman of the Republican Party of Virginia, I started a women's leadership training program. First day, first class, I said, how many of you, 25 incredibly successful women, business leaders, would consider running for office? One little timid, tiny hand went up. After eight months of training in how to network, how to raise money, how to speak publicly, I said, how many of you would consider running for office? Every hand shot up proudly, boldly in the air. We need those women to run for office. And that's the key. I think we have the message, but we lack the messengers, not because they don't exist, right. but because they're busy doing other things of value in society and in our public sphere. What we have to do is say, can you take that, channel that, and run for office? That way, it's not you know, an artificial thing where you say, okay, we need a woman, you right. let's use her face, which to uh, whoever brought it up, that Obama did with these celebrities, right? right. right. You know, that's, so, yeah. that's not what we want. What we want is we want to take the pool of talent we have and just empower those women and plant the seeds, say, run, ask them to run. And, and then, then when they run, them. though, we've got to back them up because they're going to be attacked more viciously than any of the male candidates. Exactly. The men have to be backing them up. Yeah. Whether you like them or not, right. back them up. And we also, well, and to Kate's point, we not just incur, look, women, we always second guess ourselves, like you pointed out earlier, whether it's to go ask the boss for a raise, right? Or we, we always second, we don't want to take a leadership role because we're socialized not to. So what I say too is, you know, women only gave 26% of all the funds raised during the 2010 midterm elections. That's awful, ladies. Pull out those wallets. If you know Mary Linda, any other women running, give them five bucks for Pete's sake. It's, I mean, what is five dollars? It's a gallon of ice cream. I'll and tell God, you my website you know? later. <laughs> no, no, yeah. I mean, we You're going to learn how to reach all these women, and you know, it is the superstars. <laughs> it will be someone like Mia Love from Utah that takes this country back. Yes. Right. And now, speaking of 2010, and everyone's focusing on a midterm that's coming up, we know women made that historic revolution happen. Women led Tea Party, which is effectively the stakeholders of this country, speaking about economic issues, about our families. How will that, or can it translate to 2014? Sabrina, is there, it's, it's a much more visceral kind of response than maybe polling can give us or strategy sessions can give us. But what about that point of view of women at, at the ground level, at the foundation, when it comes to what we understand instinctually? Well, I think you're right. I mean, look, in 2010, it was the first time in 20 years that we saw the gender gap, gap close. Yes. Um, this scared Democrats, no doubt. Um, but I think, I think it's going back to the message, and it's going back to actually addressing these issues and not running away from them. Right. I, I remember right early on in the 2012 election when Governor Romney was presented with the question of the Lilly-led Better Fair Pay Act. 
he was unprepared. And guess what? Most, I, I guess till, still today, 99% of Republican candidates are still unprepared to answer that question. They're unprepared to talk about the wage gap. They're uncomfortable because they think maybe there's a grain of truth to it. Guess what? There is a gap. It's not 77 cents to the dollar, but there is a gap. Does discrimination exist? Sure, some discrimination exists, but is that the overwhelming reason? Are women still a victim class that need constant government protection? No, and so we have to just start wrapping our minds around this, getting comfortable with it, and getting out there, whether you're a man or a woman, because we still have a lot of men in office. Isn't that the difference between, Crystal, the conservative message versus the liberal message? That the conservative point of view is, things are difficult, Women are required for reform, but we're not moving forward as victims. We're moving forward as conquerors versus the liberal attitude of, of wanting big government to infantilize us and to take care of us. Isn't that the inherent difference between the two That's messages? That's exactly the message. And it's the same message Democrats employ with women that they do with blacks. Blacks are helpless. Right. Blacks can't advance unless we have government, nanny government, to carry us along the way. That's what we saw with Julia. So the way to combat that, though, you know, the life of Julia should be insulting to any woman. Why didn't Mitt Romney just say that? Or have, you know, again, his surrogates. Why didn't we see more women out there for him saying, I'm insulted that he thinks that I can relate, Democrats and President Obama think that I can relate to Julia. Julia never had a man in her life. She had a baby out of wedlock. And we, this is where we win with blacks and women. We talk about the value of marriage. It's not to say that, that sometimes divorce happens, you're widowed. But let me give you, and we need to talk about the benefits of intact families, especially when it comes to minority women. Yep. But let me give you a real quick stat, which is, I mean, what we know is that, and, and I, I think it's Heritage that, that did some research around this, or maybe it was Brookings, but you know, if you are born, the power of marriage to give children the foothold in this world, they're, they're, it's just irreplaceable because two parents are gonna make the, sure the child does the homework, likely graduates from high school, and we know all the advantages to that. When a woman has a baby out of wedlock, she will never earn as much as a woman who, is, who was married and widowed or divorced, okay? So why aren't we, that's our platform, right? We are for the family. So we should talk about these issues in a compassionate way. Education helps young single moms get their kids out of failing schools. Who it is about educational empowerment, school choice yeah. and vouchers. And right now, President Obama's Justice Department is trying to kill the voucher program in Louisiana. See, and this is the connection so. as conservatives that we want personal freedom, financial freedom, yes. and that these are the kinds of connections that make that possible. Yes. And can I now, and I, I want to follow up on that with you, Kate, in the sense of when we talk about these things that are relevant to every woman, regardless of party, regardless of complexion, right. sexual orientation even, whoever you are, these things matter. Right. What do we do, and, and both of you, of course, you're in the arena, what, how do, what makes the difference? Is it women who are advising candidates? Is it besides <laughs> women running? What would make a difference for uh, the man or the woman? And by the way, it's not just any woman for the president, right? It's the right woman, and I right. mean to the right. right. Amen. Amen. Amen to that. I, uh, this, is, this is about you know, the right woman who understands about economic freedom and not dependency. How do we break free from this problem that's been very well articulated here? Well, I think you make a great point, and it's a caveat, that we're not up here saying, oh, we just need to get any women faces up there on the stage and on the screen. We're talking about principled, conservative women who right. carry forth a message. But I think one thing that we're, I've been talking a lot about defending ourselves and articulating a positive message, a freedom message for women, explaining to them we think of them as more than the sum of their body parts. But actually, frankly, this is one of my favorite things to do. I think we need to go on offense. We need to attack. Yeah. Because women are at an yeah. all-time high for poverty yeah. rates right now. <laughs> We need to point out the destruction of the leftist policies on the family, but on women in particular. And you know, a lot of times we conservatives sound really insensitive to single women. Divorced women, heaven forbid, I'm one of them, and sometimes they can be a little rough. Um, but we need to point out the fact that their economic circumstances are being decimated by Barack Obama, and he's intentionally doing that. Their educational opportunities are being eviscerated, all-time high poverty rate for, for single women, um, lack of opportunity for getting a job because businesses are not hiring because
because of all of the regulations and the taxes. Let's talk about how this impacts individual women. And for Pete's sake, let's go on offense. But you bet, Tammy, we have got to be advising our male candidates how to talk about these things. We cannot have any stupid comments this year, OK? No stupid <laughs> comments. Yes. Think. Think. Tammy, and, you and might think you're being funny. You might think that they and that it might be kind of funny. Please think before you make pithy, obnoxious comments. Think about how it's going to be spun. Can it be used to play into that war on women mantra? We need to be going on offense and not stabbing and, ourselves. And the, and and the of issue the, is, of course, we don't have control of the media. There are some great outlets like the Washington Times, Fox News, Investors Business Daily. Right. But anything, it's, it's an unfair playing field. It we is. know that. And that's what that's makes life. Republicans and conservatives better candidates because we have to be, right? Now, you're in the field. You're yeah. in the arena. How is this, as a woman, women, look, you guys are going to get Sarah Palin up here in a little bit, right? <laughs> All right. There is a reason why women candidates resonate. You're in that arena. How do you, and you are as a result a role model. You're not a bureaucrat. How does this translate when it comes to your power? Look, this is about power, ladies, right? This is about power and how we want to exercise it. How has that affected you in your work? Well, I actually had an instance when I first entered the race, within 24 hours of my filing and announcement, I was attacked um, on Twitter and from a Democratic colleague and um, of course. who specifically, was, was, make, <laughs> was specifically uh, making references to me and my physical appearance and things like that. Of course. And I had a fundraising letter come out from Ann Custer, my current uh, representative that I'm trying to defeat. Um, and the DCCC, and they all commented on me as a threat, a, a, you know, because of my values, they said, but we know Good. that it's because of what I embody. That's so, right. Anyway, so the way I responded to that, and which I think is true, and something we have to take and point out, that the reason you know, people are upset with gridlock in Washington and, you know, the lack of good people up there and all these things they say, the general perception of Washington. Well, then why, as a society, and particularly um, coming from the left when someone like me jumps into the race, why do they attack us, you know, on petty and personal things? Um, this is the reason why good people don't run for office. Right. This is the reason why women don't run for office, because who wants to deal with that Wait, kind you know, of thing? But I think it's, Marilinda, you raise a great point, and I know the reprehensible things that were said about you. Erica Harold also had awful things said about her Mia. because she was con Mia Love, because they were women and women of color, even more importantly, and conservative. But they do this because they want to, the left wants you out of these races because you break these stereotypes mm -hmm. that minorities are supposed to be beholden to the Democrat Party. You're supposed to feel enslaved to the Democrat Party and the policies that haven't helped us advance, you know, for the last 50 years, frankly. Mm -hmm. So, and, and I think when we're talking about, it's not just women, but really, where are the men in our party and leadership? They need to come out very quickly and swiftly, like Kate, I think you alluded yeah. to this. And Michelle Bachman, did they I, ever defend Michelle no, Bachman? So, I didn't see them defending men, Michelle Bachman. To men, it's never cool to talk about rape and laugh or, or anything yeah. like that. Funny and enough, you've yeah. got to come to the defense of Mary Linda and, and, yeah. and women like her when they're out there, because we know, like you said, Women don't want to run. It's just going to discourage them. So we need leadership to swiftly condemn this crap, period. Action, exactly. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, and this is. The actions. <laughs> sorry. No, please go. The actions need to be called out. And then it has to be said that this isn't about victimization. You know, you, yeah. you're not trying to present yourself as a victim. You're just saying that this has to stop. Right. And I am going to represent the end to that. You know, I'm just going right. to keep fighting and it doesn't matter what people say about me and the support, the overwhelming support and feedback I got from people was wonderful from yes. across the country. So and, I so appreciate And if we that. can also, and Sabrina will go to you on this in, in a sense that this is beyond now ourselves in, a, in a, a big way, that we have to move into for sometimes an uncomfortable zone yes. In finding our, our better selves and our more aggressive selves, we know, I mean, you know, if your child is threatened, your home is in trouble, there's a little bit of a something in you, right, that would uh, <laughs> frighten people. Right, ladies? Yeah. 
We know it's why we, it's why we like Sarah Palin. Yes, she, oh, there's a gun somewhere, and there are some big animals, and, there's a, and, and yet it is, and this is also a difference, to be powerful, Sabrina, to be secure, to be in control of our lives, but we do it with a smile and being as, uh, yeah. as I guess, as attractive as we possibly can be, <laughs> right? right? right. I mean, is that what we see when it comes to women, that we don't have to get rid of our values or become right. like right. the left? No. Right. We own our values right. and then use them to take this country back. Yeah. Absolutely. Let me say two last things. I know we're running low on time. To that point and to the point of going on offense, we need to embrace the idea of fairness. All right, the left doesn't own the idea of fairness. We know that fairness is the best predictor of a woman's support for big government. Her best, the best predictor, more than, more than her gender, more than age, more than any other demographic variable, her perception of fairness as, as equal opportunity versus equal outcome is the best predictor if she will support laws like the Paycheck Fairness Act. We have to turn the conversation around and talk about fairness. Is it fair that you can't, you have to sell your house to turn, change the school that your child goes to? Is it fair that you don't own and control your health care dollars? Is it fair that we have a $17 trillion debt that is going to be saddled on our children? No, so we need to turn the conversation around. And I'll end with this, that I have a husband, I have a father, I have a son, I have a brother. Men and women do not live in a vacuum, right? What's good for me is what's good for the men in my life and vice versa, and to the point of, of you have to stand up for women. They're being beat up on stage, that's absurd. And how can people find out more about your work, your books, yeah. and, and what you're up to? Yeah, I hope people will visit IWF.org. That's the Independent Women's Forum. Um, the author of Liberty is No War on Women with Carrie Lucas. Um, you can order it at the bookstore here, I think. Fabulous. <laughs> Crystal, final words here? Yeah, final words is we as a party hate, whether you're talking about women, men, straight people, gay people, I, I don't care what. We, we need to be talking about what we're for as the Republican Party. I know others have said this, but I was, I was sitting in the audience watching Senator Paul speak yesterday, sat next to a woman, and she and I had a conversation about the very things we're talking about today. She felt alienated, and she's frustrated, and she wanted to, she asked me, what should I do? I feel like I have no power. And that's really it. It's sad that so many women in our party feel powerless. So you know what I told her to do? Get involved in your state party, your county party. I don't care what. Make some noise. Let them know that you mean business. Your vote counts. And really, as Tammy pointed out, look at all the great women here at CPAC. We matter. And we have, we to, own it, ladies. We have to make our voice we own heard, it. folks. We have to demand seats at the table because if we don't, we will not bring more young women like Mary Linda here in our party. And we need young women. She is the future. So I challenge you all, you know, get involved and, and embrace young women and tell them what we're for. Right. We're, we're, we're for you Sabrina. achieving the American dream. Yeah. As Sabrina said, we are about economic empowerment. We're for a lot of things. Government isn't the way. Right. We're bank, you know, we're bank, government's bankrupt, the piggy bank's <laughs> bankrupt. The way that if you want to be a millionaire, you got to do it on your own, and we have the policies and the tools to help you do that. Yeah, we, we, I think it's about conservatism, empowering women versus victimizing them, reminding us that we are the ones in charge, and that is what liberals don't want you to remember, because then you, <laughs> take, you take this country back. Where can people find you, Crystal? Again? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, conservativeblackchick.com is there my blog. Go. All yeah. right, thank you, my dear. Kate. Well, I think it's important that we say, you know, we are wives and mothers and daughters, and there, nobody needs to be threatened by any of this. In fact, the men in our movement, and I think you get it, I think those of you who are right here, at least you're clapping, so I hope you get it, um, you realize that in order for conservatism to thrive and to be the majority movement and to really take over the thinking in our country, we have to embrace women as leaders. We have to elevate them, we have to support them. There are so many ways that we can do that. One is by supporting good conservative movement organizations like Independent yeah. Women's Forum, <laughs> Claire Booth Loose Policy Institute is a fabulous group. I serve on the board of that. They're elevating, promoting, encouraging young women leaders to get out there and take leadership roles. There are many of them. We can do that. But I mean it when I say we need buy-in. We need buy-in, particularly from groups like CPAC. We need to have every woman yeah. Republican governor at that podium. Yeah. They That's are amazing. Idea. And we need we need buy-in from the leadership in Congress. We need more women, conservative women, 
as um, heads of committee, where are some of these women who are incredible? Marsha Blackburn, by the way, she's incredible. Awesome. Yeah. She's awesome, but there are women, there are conservative women in Congress that should be out there when um, free contraception is being talked about, please. White men, stay behind. Let the women go out there and talk about these issues. We love white men, OK? We love older white men. It's great. But we just have to promote our women in order to start resonating, in order for people to start listening to us. We need to do that. And Kate, where can, you, where can people find you? KateOvenchain.com, a blog. And um, Divider in Chief is my uh, latest book. I wonder what that's about. Go Excellent. check it out. Excellent. Thank you very much. Mary Linda. Yes, I, I really thank you for having me here today. It's, it's been wonderful, and it's true. You know, my job as a candidate and then hopefully having that national platform in Congress will be to point out that, look, this administration is promoting equality of outcome. When the federal government does that, you're reducing everybody to the lowest common denominator. Right. We need to be talking about what our country has offered and that is what we should be promoting, and that's equality of opportunity. That's what we're all about. That's, you know, that's the innate genius of America. That's the defining characteristic of Americans, that we have an inherent and innate genius for invention and innovation, and we need to be able to apply that as we want to as individuals in a free society. So I'm working again to win this race in my website, is MaryLindaGarcia.com. Spell that M for everybody. <laughs> M-A-R-I-L-I-N-D-A. -I -I that was my grandmother Maria Very and nice. great aunt Linda. Oh. And, and thanks. My mom made it up. And, uh, <laughs> so I'd love your support. Please check me out. And because I don't want anyone to break the law, the federal max is 2,600. If you're All right. Oh, nice. <laughs> I want you guys to look around this room. You guys are going to be looking up at the stage for the rest of the night. Look around at your fellow conservatives. Some of you are maybe not even Republicans, right? Maybe you're independents, right? right? Right. Bottom line is, it is usually crowds about this size that take nations back and that, and that create revolutions. Our founding fathers created a dynamic where we're able to have our revolutions quietly in the polling place. It is up to you personally and how you view yourselves, but remembering that when people want reform and nations want reform, they turn to women yep. and they turn to us because we do know what drives the foundation of society, which is family, it is loved ones, it is love, but also being willing to do whatever it takes to make sure that the next day is one that you own and that is safe for everyone you love. That's what the conservative ideal is, individual freedom, financial freedom, so that we as Americans can look to the future as something that we will design and no one else. My thanks to every one of these great women and to you. Thanks, you guys. Thank you.